welcome. My presentation is about incident response and how my personal perception on that particular topic uh, might be of interest uh, for you. So what am I going to talk about? Just a brief overview. What's the, what are the challenges? What are the, have been the solved challenges so far? Um, what are the do's and don'ts during an investigation? Uh, and what can you do to be prepared in case of an investigation? So imagine you're working in an IT department, mid-sized company, few hundred people, uh, and all of a sudden one of the boxes starts blinking or you get a notification, you get an alert. Um, what can you do to be prepared to dig into the uh, roots for this cause, to figure out what's going on? Uh, and uh, last part is about a uh, personal research project of mine. Uh, with Together with colleagues, we uh, built something uh, really cool, I think, uh, and I'm happy to talk about that uh, at the end. So, who am I? My name is Martin Schwinecker. I'm a researcher at SBA Research. Um, maybe a few words about SBA. We are a um, uh, publicly funded research center which um, gets uh, kind of uh, an incentive to, to work in security and to uh, work with companies. So it's kind of a bit like a very, very small Fraunhofer. Uh, we have around 100 people working there. Um, and in contrast to Fraunhofer, we focus exclusively on uh, digital security and everything that's related with it. So we have, I don't know, network testing, we have pen testers, we have uh, combinatorial testing and so forth. So what's my background? Uh, I did a PhD in digital forensics and I'm still working in that area, which I find very interesting. Uh, and I'm also uh, interested in online privacy, everything that's related to Tor or can be seen as a countermeasure to digital forensics. Uh, I'm also on Twitter if you have any questions and would like to ping me after the talk with questions. So what are the goals for this talk? Why, why am I here? Um, what I'm going to talk about is a brief introduction to incident response. What, is, uh, what are particular steps that can be taken uh, in case of a possible breach or data loss or ransomware or uh, things like this? Um, I want to talk about current challenges, what are the problems right now for forensic investigations, uh, and what are the things that actually work. So usually if you have a problem, you Google it, you have like a ton of um, forum posts with people with like problems, and you never quite know what are the things that actually worked. Uh, and at least I hate that if I have a conflict problem and I see 20,000 entries and they all point nowhere. Uh, and also I want to talk about how things can blow up in your face. So um, I'm an academic. I come from uh, the, the Technical University of Vienna. Uh, and apparently reality is kind of different uh, on the outside of the academic world. So what is incident response? Basically, and probably everybody knows this in here, uh, companies fail to detect intrusions in time. You have Ashley Madison, you have Hacking Team, RSA. They all have been hacked, and this has been publicly reported that they have been hacked. Uh, Google got hacked big time uh, when they lost part of their source code for uh, Gmail, simply because someone wanted to read uh, some person's emails. Uh, and there, there are studies that uh, try to estimate the time of breach and the time of discovery of the breach, um, but they usually leave out a large portion of unreported incidents. So there, just recently there was a uh, report by the RAND Corporation uh, where they said that a zero day is uh, undetected for 180 days uh, as well as breaches, which is okay if they did their... Uh, number crunching correctly, um, but of course there's always the, the possibility of a dark uh, area where nobody knows uh, what's going on. So what the press is trying to uh, tell you what incident response is, is that there's APTs everywhere. APT, APT, APT. Uh, everybody nowadays isn't cool if he didn't get at least attacked twice with an APT. Uh, mostly what an APT uh, right now is you have a spear phishing email uh, with an uh, 
office uh, document attached and you have to enable macros uh, and then you're in the network. So this is uh, not the particular advanced persistent thread uh, that uh, the press would like us to believe that's uh, actually happening. Uh, and usually at the beginning of an investigation, uh, you have an initial report. So somebody notices something, somebody s says, oh, that's weird, uh, or you get an automatic alert from some of the, the appliances that you have stacked in your uh, server room. And uh, the, the root cause for incidents, um, why you do incident response, is to figure out what's going on, how did that happen, and how can I prevent this uh, and f future incidents uh, from happening again. Um, yeah, and usually in the beginning of an investigation, it's great if you can assemble a team and if you have uh, dedicated specialists which are ready to work with you, um, but usually that's uh, either you or someone else who uh, is known for being in, uh, into security uh, and uh, who is tasked to have a look at that. So, of course, goals, what do you want to achieve? Um, you want to have some form of reaction. You want to have uh, people looking into that, you want to have, uh, if you have an intruder in your network, you want to have that intruder uh, kicked out, uh, and you want to contain it if it's still in the network. And of course, uh, you want to close any entry doors uh, that may be open, so you need to figure out how the attacker got in and uh, what steps he uh, has taken uh, inside of the network. Um, so this is where my uh, area comes in. Uh, usually it's something like live forensics under time pressure, so you have uh, someone in your network and you know that there is somebody, but you need to figure out where to log, where to find traces that are left behind, uh, on which machines uh, the attacker has been, uh, and so forth. Uh, and ideally, of course, you move faster than the attacker, so you can prevent uh, further exploitation uh, and also you can work remotely because nobody likes to jog around office buildings trying to figure out where this particular machine is that might or might not have been compromised uh, to do further analysis. So, of course, there's always time pressure. Um, if the management uh, would have uh, an answer by yesterday, that's really great. Um, usually, if, if you do not have any public exposure, so if you do not have any uh, news entries, postings, uh, anything uh, which relates to that you might or might not have been breached, um, that's okay. Um, but if the press is involved and the uh, public is knowledgeable that something is going on, um, then it's uh, rather stressful. Um, there was uh, Petya just a few weeks ago, uh, there was the, the shipping company Maya, Maersk, um, Mayask, Maersk, don't know how to pronounce it, uh, and what they did was to, to have a dedicated page just to keep people informed on the ongoing investigation, what they're doing, what they're trying, uh, and so forth. So the, the public part of incident responses, um, aside from the technical part, also very important. So what is the context of academia in this uh, area? Because usually you want to have a techie, you want to know someone who, who can work on the wire, uh, and you do not wa want uh, someone from the ivory tower to, to look into your problems and to dig into your uh, networks. Um, academia usually is something like the ivory tower uh, in a sense that they simulate, they have their lab set up, they uh, try to make things work and prove that an idea is valid, uh, and yet they cannot, um, cannot operate in a uh, dirty environment, uh, a natural grown network uh, just alike. Uh, this can be very tricky. Um, however, what academia has the benefit is that it's uh, rather watchful. Um, probably not like Sauron, and uh, every professor who feels uh, offended by this, I'm sorry. Um, but usually uh, you got the opportunity in academia to, to browse ideas and to discuss them widely uh, instead of within a confined uh, public group, which is uh, very beneficial in uh, such scenarios. So, 
Another problem of, of science or why, why academia can be um, uh, challenging in this field is that you always have the, the conflict science versus engineering. So um, usually many forensic investigations, they're pure investigations uh, without any academic value or without any in engineering value. But then you have these particular problems that academia likes to focus on, uh, which are really hard. And uh, scientists want to figure out how to improve the status quo, how to make things better or get better insights. Uh, and the tricky part, because forensics is, or um, uh, incident response is really applied, is to convince uh, an academic reviewer that this is something novel and this is something publishable. Uh, because the field in uh, security in uh, academia is really, really fast. Um, usually you can find a paper weeks before its publication uh, online, simply because then the authors have the benefit of spreading their uh, ideas faster uh, than their com competitors, so to say. So in the, the reviewer is then in a tough position because he's not into the, the idea, but usually those practical papers, they have uh, a thorough evaluation and they have some uh, points which are valid. Um, so this, this is really um, tricky because it's new in the context of security, um, maybe not so new in the uh, area of systems security, uh, and in particular in, in totally different research areas like medicine or psychology, um, this is well established. So you have studies, you have their uh, layout for how to conduct proper science and to how to conduct studies, um, but uh, in, in this particular area this is rather challenging. Another example is that uh, many things in computer security are rather narratives. So they are based either on uh, marketing material, on um, people selling stuff, uh, and uh, there's not much uh, of an evidence-based science going on here. So if you have a new um, if you have a new drug, you test it, you have your statistical tests at the end, uh, and then you can conclude whether it works uh, or not. Um, but it's not the same thing for digital security, because if you have a new idea, and even the most simple ones, like is it beneficial to have an antivirus scanner in your network, are very hard to answer, because of course having antivirus is what everybody thinks, yes of course you need antivirus in particular on Windows, um, but it's really hard to prove it from a, an academic point of view uh, in a real environment whether or not this is actually um, beneficial. Uh, also, just at the last CCC, uh, Hanno have an, had an excellent talk on that topic. Uh, and if you're interested in that, um, go have a look. So, one of the benefits of academia, uh, we have creativity, we have independence, and we have uh, plenty of minions uh, that can do work with us. Uh, and problem is that we do not have that much money. So, compared uh, the uh, budgets of larger corporations with academia, we are so cheap compared to that. Um, it's uh, astonishing. So, if you buy a consultant for, I don't know, a week. Uh, this is almost a uh, salary for half a year for a student. And in particular, uh, everything from software licenses, funky equipment, all those things um, do not work that good in academia because they are mostly uh, very expensive. So, still, when I started in this area, and I, I started with my PhD years and years ago, uh, there have been just a few publications that are generally that were generally perceived as standards. So one was RFC 3227 uh, is remarkable because um, it dictates the order of volatility. So the basic idea is you have a breach, you try to collect the things that vanish first uh, as well as first. Then there was NIST special, special publication 886 from 2006. Um, again, trying to figure out standardized procedures how to do incident response. Um, they also specify that you have to use a write blocker. So if you have a hard drive and you want to investigate it, uh, you have to use a proper blocking tool that prevents modifications of the disk. 
yeah, still, uh, even though those standards are already really old, they um, have all the principles in them that uh, is used for um, the the scientific progress uh, that followed for me uh, thereafter. So what what are the current challenges? Uh, one of the most influential papers of uh, my work uh, was written by Simpson Garfinkel like uh, seven years ago. Uh, it was published at uh, the FRWS conference. Uh, and what it was was more or less like a position paper in particular with focus on digital forensics and uh, incident response in which Simpson made a list of all the things that work well currently and at the moment uh, and things that will become very challenging in the near future and uh, most of those things um, written in there uh, have been correct so one of the the things that have been written there was that uh, there was some kind of golden age of digital forensics so computerization progressed and uh, people did more and more work with their computers and uh, digital forensic techniques allowed them to uh, look into the past more or less so you had a file system and was structured with a very very comprehensive structure um, which you could parse and then you could uh, sort it and timeline it and so forth uh, which could give you a very very accurate um, detail of what the person or the persons in front of the computer have been doing. Uh, also, the, the challenges they faced have been rather simple compared to uh, the, the complex uh, problems that I'm going to talk about soon. Uh, also, RAM forensics was possible, so you could acquire the, the content of a RAM. Uh, you could acquire the, the content of network communications, uh, and everybody was happy, more or less. Um, what Simpson wrote was that some of the challenges uh, that will be faced in the future are, uh, for example, flash, sto uh, flash storage, SSD drives. Uh, so usually in an investigation, you, you take the hard drive, uh, you make an image of it, and then you start digging into uh, artifacts like files or uh, deleted files which have not yet been overwritten. Uh, the problem with flash storage is that uh, you have up to three microcontrollers on the hard drive uh, that can fuck you up in, in this process because um, if you copy a file to a different uh, or if you edit a file um, it is not replaced uh, at the same position just with uh, magnetic drives um, but the, the storage controller can put it anywhere so the, the Compared to regular hard drive, SSDs are very complex and uh, a lot of the responsibility of the storage controller um, puts um, uh, something in between the analyst and uh, the actual data. Uh, also what he uh, said was lack of time, of course. Um, this is equivalent to storage sizes, so like 10 years ago, how, much, uh, how, how big were hard drives? Actually, I don't remember. But uh, comparing, I don't know, one of my first hard drives I bought was 30 gigabytes. That was uh, like, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago. Um, nowadays, you can buy a 12 terabyte hard drive, which is uh, really good. Um, yeah. Also, the, the number of artifacts you could observe have been becoming more diverse. So you have a long, long list of possible uh, vectors that you can analyze, uh, but due to lack of time, you will focus on the most promising ones. Uh, he also said cloud. Cloud is, of course, uh, challenging because uh, it's not stored locally and you somehow have to uh, get the data uh, out of the cloud again. Uh, encryption is a problem. Oh, problem. Um, I'm very much pro-encryption if it's done properly. Uh, it's just uh, very uh, convenient. Um, also, the number of devices will increase and very much increased. Uh, so everyone has a pocket computer in their pocket. Uh, they have a notebook, a tablet, and uh, at least three, I don't know, PlayStation or smart TVs, uh, cars, all those things that store information digitally, uh, which can be then very uh, cumbersome to analyze. Um, and making this 
uh, much more challenging than uh, it used to be. So storage capacity is a problem still today. Um, you have, like I said, 12 terabyte hard drive costs about 600 euro right now. Uh, if you buy four of them and put them in a software rate, uh, then you have really, really a lot of uh, storage capacity. Uh, and one of the problems with this huge amount of storage is um, the time it takes to before you can start uh, looking into the data. So the, the forensic process uh, usually dictates that you have to hash the data. So you build a cryptographic hash sum uh, over the entire hard drive. Um, then you can copy it and then you have to hash it again to prove that uh, you did not modify the information in any way by simply copying it. Um, but if you think of a 12 terabyte hard drive, if you have to read it from the very first byte uh, until the last byte, this takes something between 18 to, I don't know, 32 hours. Uh, and then you have to rinse, repeat, and do it three times in a row. Um, this is a lot of time, uh, which can be problematic uh, in incident response, simply because you want to dig into the data right away. Uh, if you have money, uh, there's special hardware for that. So you have uh, so-called forensic bridges where you can plug into the uh, devices you want to acquire uh, and they do everything in one step. So you just have to um, wait for um, one third uh, of the time. Yeah. In particular on slow interfaces, if you have a two terabyte external hard drive which reads 20 megabytes a second, ages, just ages. Yeah. Also, if you uh, think about production systems, so if you walk into a company and uh, you want to take the productive exchange offline, this is nothing which will ever happen. Um, sysadmins will throw themselves in your way uh, to stop you from taking down the productive exchange system. Uh, so plenty, plenty of challenges um, that uh, one has to overcome to uh, get actually starting with the forensic investigations. So just a few examples. Um, there have been plenty of engineering efforts to reduce the time used in these steps and to, to gain already insights into the uh, stored data from the beginning. So the National Software Reference Library, NSRL, um, it's published by NIST every three months, uh, and it contains plenty of software installations which you can hash and then exclude from the files that might be of interest for the investigation because every Windows installation kind of is uh, the same and you have plenty of files which are uh, redundant on every hard drive. Um, also, there has been work uh, again by Simpson uh, on identifying file fragments because usually if you uh, delete a file, of course it's not magically gone, but only the reference to the file is gone. So either by using file carving or uh, file fragment identification techniques, you can figure out which files have been stored on that drive. Yeah. But some of the optimizations are not that optimal. Uh, one sifting collectors, uh, for example, proposes to use a prioritization during the, the analysis process. So you start with the most promising files uh, and then you start going down. But there's a certain point in time where you have to stop, stop looking at things uh, and uh, you cannot ignore the rest which is there. But on the economic side, it doesn't make sense to look into everything. Um, so there has to be some form of uh, conclusive um, process some some form of general agreement of I don't know anyone to to figure out when it does not make sense anymore uh, to dig any deeper. So encryption, of course, uh, makes uh, investigations tricky. Uh, the good thing during investigations is that usually people want you to look into your things, so they they give you the recovery key, the password, uh, and so forth. Um, but if you want to hide something, if you want to encrypt something, um, this works and is usually uh, not bypassable. Also, uh, both devices and uh, on the network, more and more information is encrypted, which is absolutely a fantastic thing. But still, encryption can be bypassed. Uh, it can be fingerprinted. So instead of 
watching the the uh, communication content, uh, communication metadata is inspected. And of course you can do traffic analysis on who is communicating with whom, uh, how much data are they exchanging, uh, and so forth. Cisco just a few weeks ago had a white paper on encrypted traffic analysis. Uh, they probably figured out that uh, the world is moving towards HTTPS uh, and everything is encrypted and their uh, shiny boxes cannot s look into the details anymore. One of the challenges, which is still very much a challenge, is the heterogeneity of devices. So um, if you are in the position of needing software for Android or iPhone, this is doable. But if you find someone with a Lumia phone and you want to dig into that phone, this is really hard because nobody makes tools uh, for the, the so-called long tail, where very few devices and very low probability that you will find someone uh, who will actually pay for you to develop this. Uh, so the, the, the most common things like um, Mac, Linux, Windows, they, they work fine with the commercial tools. But if you have more on the exotic side, um, this can be very tricky. Also, cloud forensics is a lie. Um, there, in, in particular, in academia, there have been uh, publications on uh, cloud forensics in particular. But usually, cloud, that's at least my perception and my uh, opinion, uh, cloud forensics means either it is remotely accessible, just like EC2, you have a machine, you can log in, uh, and you can do things there, or it's some form of non-publicly described API, uh, which does your uh, software magic. But both of them are new. You have methods for both ways, uh, and you do not need some form of new methodology or new uh, nomenclature to, to figure out how to do forensics on those things. And again, commercial world is already very far. Um, for infrastructure as a service, you can use just the regular tools. Um, and for uh, software as a service, like uh, smartphone applications and so forth, uh, usually you can fiddle around. You can reverse engineer the Android applications, trying to find the communication endpoints and then uh, reverse the, the communication. Uh, what's also going to be very interesting, uh, at least from my personal perception again, uh, is GDPR, the General Data Protection uh, Legislation, which will go into effect on May 2018. Um, because in particular for, for companies, they have to be able to tell their employees what information they, per, uh, they, they store of their browser usage, their um, digital artifacts, uh, and so forth. And yeah, in particular for larger companies, uh, if they haven't yet started to look into GDPR, um, they hopefully very soon will. So what, what are the do's and don'ts of uh, incident response? First rule of incident response is you have to get a RAM image. You want to get the data which is stored in the uh, random access memory, uh, and you want to have it in a forensically sound uh, manner. Um, second rule of incident response is you have to get a RAM image. Uh, again, uh, you want to have it. In, you want to have it really badly. Why the RAM? Of course, everything that's juicy is in there. So many law enforcement agencies still today uh, they go for th the that approach. So they storm into the building. They pack everything that uh, looks like storage media, uh, and they drag it into the lab. Um, but if they find a running PC, usually they just pull the plug, plug box it, uh, and then ship it. This is very much problematic because encryption keys and uh, open files information and so forth uh, is lost in the process. Uh, also, it's of course uh, non-reproducible, so you, if you have a RAM image, you have the exact snapshot of what was going on in that machine uh, at that particular point in time. Uh, once you have the RAM image, and I will uh, shortly talk about how you can get a RAM image, uh, you can inspect the machine. You can try, uh, for example, on Windows, you can use the SUS internal tools to look into running processes or open network connections. Um, but depending on uh, how well you know these tools, uh, your mileage may vary. Uh, also, what you really do not want to do is to 
uh, force anything that's persistent uh, on disk. So you do not want to search for files or anything which, which touches the hard drive a lot. Um, you want to focus on the things that are on that machine, um, but do not put it on the hard drive. Also, there's this tunnel conflict between uh, rebooting the machine or uh, pulling the plug. Uh, usually, if you have uh, the perception that the operating system may be compromised, uh, you want to pull the plug, simply because shutdown processes can be manipulated uh, and information can be uh, forever lost if you simply shut down uh, the machine. Um, but depending on the environment and the context, you can also just shut down the machine uh, because the, the user would shut it down uh, anyway. Once a machine is dead, it's of course dead. Uh, there has been the cold boot attack where you can get the RAM content even uh, 10 minutes after the computer has been shut down. Uh, but this is a rather ex esoteric approach. So, so in my perception, once a machine is dead, uh, it's dead. And it stays dead uh, until the bitter end. Also, you do not want to reboot the machine because, again, RAM is wiped during reboot uh, and uh, the information in there uh, is lost. So for, for regular investigations, what you, the best case you can get is uh, you have one machine which might or might not be compromised. Uh, you do not have any lateral network movement uh, and the breach is contained in time. This is the best case. This is a piece of cake. This is what you can easily work with. Um, Reality, however, is often very, very much different. Uh, for example, nowadays you can have server machines with a terabyte uh, of RAM. Uh, and if you want to, if just thinking of uh, taking this one terabyte of RAM and making an image out of it, again, takes ages because you either have to dump it to an external hard drive, which are slow, uh, or you have to transfer it over the network, which also is very much slow. Uh, also, a breach is usually not local in uh, one machine, but it uh, could be the entire network, it could be an entire VLAN, uh, and you want to investigate all those machines at once, uh, which can be tricky. Um, you can have very much, uh, very fast uh, network links, 10 gigabit upwards, uh, which again is very hard to uh, acquire, mostly because uh, mass storage devices do not have 10 gigabit uh, capacity uh, and you need to figure out a way to, to get access to that data. So how can you get a RAM image? Uh, usually for, for Windows, uh, best approach is FTK Imager. It's a free tool. Uh, you install it uh, and it uh, gives you a button that you can click on to acquire the RAM image and just pipe it onto an external hard drive or uh, over the network. Uh, there are also Redline is from Mandiant and many of the forensic uh, toolkits already include a free tool uh, which you can then use to uh, acquire RAM images. Uh, on Linux there's Lime, it's a kernel extension uh, which you can load dynamically at runtime uh, which gives you direct and raw uh, RAM access. Um, similar thing on Mac OS, um, this is doable. Uh, recall uh, as part of GUR, which I will talk briefly about in a minute, um, works for all of the above. So if you have the, the capacity and the, uh, the will to, to dig into GUR, this is probably the best way to have a universal way to uh, dig into RAM. Uh, for mobile devices on Android, uh, again, there is Lime, uh, which you can push uh, with the ADB interface. Uh, on iOS, um, there's nothing you could try uh, to, to do uh, simply because it's designed in that particular way. So what can you um, or what, what could be your takeaway to, to be prepared um, when uh, shit hits the fan? What can you do to uh, have something ready uh, to, um, yeah, just a few tricks to, to be uh, prepared. Uh, first thing is, of course, lock all the things. Um, every machine has a log file, every application has log files. Um, best way is to centrally lock them uh, and this can help you tremendously. Um, even though log management is still a tedious task, um, best way is to just push it into a login machine or a pipeline uh, and have it there ready uh, 
uh, once you need it. Um, even simple things like NetFlow informations from, from fancy switching boxes uh, can help uh, in case no other information is uh, pertained. Um, yeah, for networks, uh, the, the uh, upper class switching um, boxes uh, or upper class switches, routers, uh, usually what they have is so called mirror port. So they can use the uplink port and mirror it uh, seamlessly uh, to another port. Um, but you can also do it on a budget. So just mirroring network traffic uh, is, is rather cheap. Uh, best example is this. Particular, it's just a random manageable uh, gigabit switch from Amazon, um, which has gigabit on all the ports and offers the uh, possibility to mirror traffic. Uh, the good thing about traffic mirroring is that it's completely passive, so an attacker cannot see that you're actually inspecting traffic. I think this box is about 40, 50 euro, um, which is really cheap. You can also use this. Um, it's a bit more expensive, but it has an open Linux on it, uh, and you can already run analysis on uh, that uh, box, uh, which can filter out some of the, the traffic. Yeah. Then again, reality kicks in. Um, where do you place this uh, particular network tab? Um, I tried to do this in uh, SBA. Uh, problem was that if I place it before the firewall, uh, I'd have to have numerous uh, mirror parts. Um, if you would have to put it after the firewall, I will not see the real IP because the, the firewall does not, uh, and the modem only sees uh, one IP communicating with the with the firewall. And uh, this is a problem because I can either lose information or uh, lose uh, scope uh, for uh, only half of the building, for example. For f collecting logs, there there is a lot of open source, uh, which is readily available. You have the Elk stack, uh, you have Greylock, you have OSSEC, uh, which can all uh, pipe the logs over the network into a bin uh, so that you have it uh, in place once you need it. Also, the Microsoft world, there's something like Windows Event Collector. Uh, and even though I've never worked with it, it probably does uh, the same thing, simply judging by the name. Uh, also, you can use Splunk or anything uh, if you have enough money. Um, but the, the top three, they are free. You just need to have a machine to have it running. And then there's the, the funky part. So again, reality kicks in. Uh, you're trying to figure out how to monitor uh, this. And this is, again, very tricky because you have high number of uh, devices, uh, large network capacity. Um, and mostly I put the picture here because you do not want to go down in the basement where the actual servers are. Uh, so this is where Google GUR comes into place. I'm a huge fan of it. Um, it's built dedicatedly for incident response. Uh, and this is the system that Google uses internally for their incident response. Uh, you, could ha you could also have uh, smaller uh, solutions like PowerShell. PowerShell now runs on Windows, Linux, uh, and Mac. Uh, there's also the Linux subsystem on Windows. You could try to work backwards uh, to, to get access uh, remotely. But GUR is the thing that usually floats your boat. Um, again, trying to deploy GUR in uh, the office didn't work um, because some complained that they have sensitive customer data on their devices, which cannot possibly be exposed uh, in any particular way. And then we have privacy and legal implications. Simply, we cannot uh, allow personal devices, which are used by employees, um, to, to be inspected at any time, which is a good thing, of course. Um, what I then use it, used it for is for infrastructure. So you can have GUR on hosting all the uh, on all the hosting servers that you can control uh, and uh, have it running all the time. So I'm I'm a bit short on, of time. Um, still, GUR. So the good thing about GUR is that it works remote and it's remote all the time. Uh, the logic is server side, so you have your central uh, uh, server which. Uh, hosts all the information, uh, and the way 
Square works is that it has an agent running on every machine. Um, good thing is that uh, installation is really simple. You click it. You do not even have to click next, next, next. Um, it's like the perfect botnet. You just click it, it installs, uh, and you have it up and running. Uh, and also, um, offline clients run the tasks as soon as they're back online. So once uh, the machine is back, simply because it didn't get the, the task, uh, because it was rebooting or uh, having network issues, uh, as soon as the machine is back, it will fetch the task completed uh, and send the results. Yeah, the, the good thing, the really good thing about Gur is that it has scalability uh, in mind. Allegedly, there are setups with more than 100,000 uh, machines monitored. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's a long, long term supported project. It's publicly available, GitHub uh, and all the things. Um, only downside I could figure out was that it has, of course, privacy and legal implications, uh, which are not trivial to overcome. One of the really cool things of GUR is that you do not need to transfer the RAM image. Uh, GUR offers you a straight way into the kernel of the machine. Uh, so you could use volatility on the live RAM, which is really, really cool because you do not have to um, transfer hundreds of gigabytes of RAM uh, and you do not need to store them and you do not need the time to process it. You, simply use volatility on the running machine uh, and everything is in place uh, for your investigation. Yeah. Another nice feature of GUR is that you could do hunts. So all the machine which are orchestrated by your uh, GUR master, um, you could task them all at once, uh, saying, for example, if a new, I don't know, new antivirus, Mandy and F-Secure, something, something, uh, super malware is published. Uh, usually it contains indicators of compromise uh, and these are usually hashes of files or mutexes or uh, similar things uh, and you can pipe this information right into the, the uh, GUR console uh, and have it run on all machines within minutes. Um, as you can see I, I have an HP notebook uh, there was a bug uh, in one of the audio drivers which used to lock everything uh, every keystroke uh, into a file um, and uh, in our office people had to walk from desk to desk and see if this file is here but with GUR this would have taken 30 seconds uh, for every uh, affected machine so um, now uh, short uh, contextual cut uh, to, to work that we have been doing. Um, PicaTorrent um, is in a later step of an investigation of relevance uh, because it takes a hard drive image and it can tell you information uh, about the hard drive image simply by looking at the file fragments it finds on there. So you have the image, you have uh, all the uh, the hashing and all the preparation has been done. Um, and what you would like then to know is uh, what remaining artifacts can you identify on that drive? What is still left there, uh, which was once possibly uh, on there? Uh, and the way we approached this problem was uh, you have to have a lot of file hashes. Uh, and one of the file hashes database par excellence is peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Because usually in peer-to-peer -peer file sharing, you have uh, gigatons of hash values swirling around the network simply because people want to share files and they want to identify the file based uh, on a hash value. So for investigations, uh, usually you would like to ignore all these because they are neither the cause nor uh, the cure for your problems. I mean, Justin Bieber maybe is, but Deadpool probably not. So how can you exclude this information? You have 12 terabytes of data. This is part of some uh, office file sharing server. They had, I don't know, um, Rick and Morty, all of them on there. Uh, and you want to figure out if this is really Rick and Morty and it's really the latest episode uh, or not. Um, our approach was to, to harvest as many torrent files as possible uh, and uh, 
work with them to figure out uh, which parts of the sectors uh, can be identified. Uh, also, one of the very nice things about uh, torrent files is that they are copyright free because the content that is used to sharing, of course, is copyright protected in many cases, uh, but the torrent file does not uh, pertain the same uh, privileges. Uh, what we then did uh, was to extract all the hash values, um, pipe it into the uh, wonderful tools, bulk extract and hash DB. Uh, again, open source software, which is specifically built for uh, investigations with a very specific uh, set of tasks. Uh, and we published it uh, last year. So just a few words uh, about the hashes. Uh, everything in uh, BitTorrent is hashed with SHA-1. Uh, and SHA-1 is very common uh, in digital investigations as well. Uh, and what you would like to figure out is uh, which part uh, of chunks are absolutely irrelevant. Um, yeah. What the real benefit of this investigation is that it's fast, it's really fast, not because we use torrent files, but because bulk extract is built in a way uh, that it's really fast. Uh, I once saw a presentation by Simpson Garfinkel where he um, said that uh, they once had access to a machine with 200 CPU cores uh, and bulk extractor pinned all of them. It, it was just pure parallelization uh, at its best and uh, the more cores you added, uh, the faster it will be done. Um, also, it can find uh, deleted and even partially overwritten files. Uh, so you can say afterwards deliberately that on this PC, Justin Bieber was stored. Um, also, the, the hash DB files, which drop out at the end, uh, can be easily shared. Uh, and I will show you that in a second. So how did we pursue that? Uh, our goal was to, to get as many uh, BitTorrent files as possible. Uh, of course, the first approach was to build a crawler uh, that crawls Pirate Bay, Kickers, Torrents, and all those uh, file sharing uh, sites to, to get as many torrent files as possible. Uh, and in the end, I think after a four or five month uh, period, we ended up with 3.3 billion chunk hash values, um, which, if you add it up, gives you up to 2.6 petabytes of information. So everything that has been shared with these file sharing things uh, adds up to 2.6 uh, petabytes and the, the tool chain is readily available. Uh, but what we then did, and this is new, this, is, um, this happened after the publication of the paper, um, we also used a DHT crawler, uh, which listened on the uh, uh, queries that come in on the distributed hash table, uh, and we got another two million uh, torrent files, which we could then index and which we could then boost the the capacity or the the maximum amount of information uh, up to 6.5 petabytes. So sharing is caring, of course. Um, the paper, the tools, and everything uh, is uh, online. Uh, and I'd be happy in particular to get feedback to this because the uh, forensic community where I presented that uh, was rather not impressed, uh, I'd say. Um, so I'm presenting it here and I'd love to hear your feedback and if this is of value for your specific tasks uh, or if it was uh, wasted time. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Was is very <laughs> Thank you very much for this very informative talk, Martin. There's still a bit time left for questions. Do you have any questions? Please line up. Here are, here are two microphones. Um, one more in the back, one here in the front. Um, anybody have questions? So I would have a question. Oh, you, there's, here's somebody. <laughs> Am I on the, yeah, good. Um, so you looked at the, uh, a whole lot of torrent files uh, and you collected hashes from the files that are contained by the, mm -hmm. the actual content of the torrent. Excuse me, excuse me, can we go a bit closer? Closer, yeah, yes. ah, ah right there, there I am. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
But some of those files might actually be malicious files and, and mm -hmm. malware. Did you do any filtering on that? No. So the, the beauty of it is that this is just an additional step towards finding out what's on it. Uh, so what you can find uh, is the, the torrent file which is uh, relevant for this particular sectors uh, and then you can inspect it. You can see which files ha are on it, which files have been identified. Uh, so yeah, um, there was no filtering, um, but uh, yeah, the, the, what I have forgot to mention is uh, the beauty of this technique is not to confine it on BitTorrent files because usually just in Bieber or whatever is not that impressive, um, but you can pipe any information you have uh, into it. So for example, if you have the suspicion that one of your developers took code, um, you can just pipe the code, torrent it, and then uh, apply this probably not publish it because then it would be public torrent. Um, but um, this works without any uh, knowledge of the content itself. So I would like to know uh, what's your preferred system? What do you, how do you do it? Um, on my notebook I have Linux. Uh, my servers are Linux. Um, my PC at home is Windows. Um, yeah, a mixture, a bit of everything. And uh, did you ever have a big incident you wanted us to tell about? Um, not that I'm allowed to talk about it, no. <laughs> well, okay. So, are there any other questions? Okay, so thank you very much again. Martin Schmidegger. <laughs>